Lesson 15 is systems of linear inequalities. That means two or more inequalities grouped together to create a system. 15.1 is about modeling, which is just another word for kind of creating a inequality in this case to represent a real life situation. So starting from the top, the ninth graders at Anytown High School are going on a school trip to see a play. Adult tickets to the play are $10 and student tickets to the play are $8. The school spend up to $600 for the trip. The number of students and adults going on the trip will be at least 65. And because a certain number of adults must come on the trip as chaperones, we want to use adult tickets as the independent variable A. And the number of students will be the dependent variable S. Create a system of inequalities to represent this situation, then graph the system to find our solution set. So I'm going to skim back through the problem and just underline or highlight important information. Remember with word problems, you're not supposed to be able to figure out the answer after reading it for the first time. It's meant to be read a few times over to be able to pull out information before we can even begin the problem. So starting with the second sentence, it says adult tickets are $10. And then student tickets are $8. That's important. The school spend up to $600 for the trip, the word or the phrase up to is usually some sort of indicator that we need to use an inequality as opposed to an equation because it's not exactly $600. Um, the number of students and adults going on the trip is at least 65. At least it's another indicator word for an inequality as opposed to an equation. Um, and then after that, it gives us what our variable should be. So it says the adult tickets will be the independent variable A, and then the number of students or student tickets will be the dependent variable S. And then now we're ready to start writing our inequalities. So I think um, the one that comes faster to me is like writing how many in total are going to be going. So maybe you're the same, maybe not, but it doesn't matter. We should end up with the same inequalities after we write both either way. So let's start with the number of students. and adults going on the trip will be at least 65. So that means that if we take the number of adult tickets purchased, which is A, plus the number of student tickets, which is S, that should be at least 65. So it's not going to be equal to 65. We have to think about what at least means. At least means it can be exactly 65 or more than 65. So if it can be more than, than the greater than symbol, the open side has to be pointed towards the A and the S, and then we put the line underneath it for or equal to. This A plus S represents how many tickets are going to be purchased in total, and that needs to be greater than or equal to at least 65. So the open side goes towards the A and the S. And then for our second inequality, we can start to incorporate how much the tickets cost. So adult tickets are ten dollars so it's gonna be 10 a student tickets are eight dollars so that's gonna be eight s and then they'll spend up to six hundred dollars for the trip so in total like how much is going to be spent on an adult ticket it's ten dollars per ticket so it'd be ten times the number of adult tickets that are purchased and then eight dollars for student tickets so it'd be plus eight times the amount of student tickets that are purchased and then the school spent up to six hundred dollars so not exactly six hundred dollars that would be an equal sign um up to means that like six hundred is the most that they will spend they can spend six hundred dollars or anything less than that so you do less than or equal to six hundred so this 10a plus 8s that represents how much total is going to be spent and that total needs to be less than or equal to 600. Okay so the next thing I want to do is because we're going to graph these we usually graph with like x and y so I'm just going to convert these inequalities to x and y and if you recognize like that you know right here It said that adult tickets is the independent variable. And if you remember, the independent variable goes on the x-axis. You can just put that as is without changing to x and y. But I think that that can be a little bit confusing at times. So I'm going to go ahead and change these to x and y. So remember that independent variable, that's x. So a's are going to get replaced with x's. 
and then the dependent variable is y. So that means that y's are going to replace the s's. So x goes in for a, y goes in for s. So it's hard to say s and x together, so I'm sorry if those sounded similar. So, okay, x's are going in for the a's, so right here and right here. And then y's are going in for the s's right here and right here. So this first inequality, instead of a, it would be x for the adult tickets plus y for the student tickets is greater than or equal to 65. And then the second inequality would be 10x plus 8y is less than or equal to 600. And then now, technically, we don't really need the um, first set of inequalities anymore. So I think I'm just going to go ahead and erase that so we don't like feel like we need to do anything with it. And then one thing I do just want to make a sorry, make a note of is like off the side writing that, you know, I changed X was for the adult tickets and then Y was for the student tickets. Since they're not using like the same um, first letter as our variable, um, that way it's kind of like a little reminder of it for us if we forget. Okay, so now um, before we put these equations in slope intercept form, which is the form we want them in for graphing. I'm gonna go ahead and just label the x and y axis. So one thing to consider is a lot of times our graph, you know, they have the x axis and the y axis. I said those in reverse order, but the x axis, the one that goes side to side, the y axis, the one that goes up and down. And then we have what's called like these four quadrants, like this is quadrant one, two, three, four. But sometimes in real, real world situations like this one we don't really need all four quadrants because in some of the quadrants there are negative values so like in quadrant two and three the x's are negative and then in quadrant three and four the y's are negative since the like x's and y's represent the number of student tickets or adult tickets purchased it doesn't really make sense to have negatives because we can't purchase a negative amount of tickets so that means that we only need this first quadrant right here. So instead of putting my x and y axis in the middle, I'm just gonna put it on the far left and the bottom. So this is my x, this is my y, and then x was the number of adult tickets. So I'm gonna put that on the axis. And then y was the number of student tickets, so I'm going to put that on the y-axis. And then now that my graph is set up, um, I'm ready to go ahead and get my equations in, or inequalities in the correct form. So usually to graph it, we want them to be in slope-intercept form, which is y equals mx plus b. I know that this has an equation, these are inequalities, but it's the order that we're looking at, so the order of the terms. Um, one of the main things with slope-intercept form is that the y is isolated, so that means that it's by itself on its own side of the inequality. So I'm going to move this down to give myself some more space. In the first inequality, if I want to get y by itself, I have to subtract the x over. X minus X is zero, so that cancels out. And then I bring down my Y is greater than or equal to. And then the other thing that we need to pay attention to with the formula is that the like M X part comes first and then the B part comes second. So let's be first, let's be second. So I actually want my negative X to come first and then the 65 to come second. So negative X plus 65 since this was a positive 65. Okay, so in slope intercept form, um, y by itself, and then the term with x comes first, and then what's called the constant term comes second. That's a term that doesn't have a variable attached to it. So this is good. I'm going to leave it as is. And then for the second inequality, I'm going to give myself a little bit more space. Um, still same goal to get it into slope intercept form to get y by itself. So I have to start by subtracting over the 10x, subtract it right here. 
10x minus 10x is 0, so that cancels it out on the left side. I bring down my 8y, and then my is less than or equal to, and then same thing, I want the term with the x to come first, so I'm going to write that negative 10x first. And then I would do plus 600 since that's a positive 600. Okay, still want to get y by itself. It's not fully by itself yet. That 8 is being multiplied by y. So to undo multiplication, I use division. So divide by 8, divide by 8, divide by 8. 8 divided by 8 is 1y left over. And then remember, you don't need to write the 1 in front. And then is less than or equal to, and then the um, negative 10 divided by 8 is not a whole number, but there is a fraction there that we can reduce. So I would do like 10 and 8 both have a common factor of 2. So to reduce them, I would divide them both by 2. So negative 10 divided by 2 is negative 5, and then 8 divided by 2 is 4. And then that x just kind of tags along. So it just stays next to it. And then next I can do 600 divided by 8 right here, which is 75, so plus 75. Okay, so we have them both in slope-intercept form now. Now we can go ahead and find the slope, which remember, just in our formula, slope is m. So that's the number that's in front of x. So for the first inequality, there's no number in front of x, just a negative symbol. So that would mean that m is negative 1. And then b is like, the, it's the constant term, the one that doesn't have the variables. So that's 65. That's going to be my y-intercept or where I begin my graph. And then on the second inequality, my m is negative 5 fourths. And then my B is 75. So my Bs, those are where I would start on the y-axis. I would have to put a point at those numbers. So if I try to scale my y-axis, which we need to label our scale, if I try to do 1, 2, and so on, I'm not going to make it to 75. So I have to pick a different number. Um, we want a number that is going to make sure there's enough space to get up to 65 or 75 but also not like too much space to where all my points are like really low down here. So I'm gonna try five, it should be enough room. So we'll do everything by five. So this would be five, 10, 15, 20. I'm just gonna write like every other one just for space reasons. So this is 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50. 55, oh, yeah, oh, oh, that's what I did, I wrote 45 instead of writing 50, um, so this was 40, and then this is 45, and then this will be 50. So 50 right here, and then this, I'm going to erase some of these lines, so I can kind of start fresh. This is 55, this is 60, this is 65, this is 70. And then that's 75. I'm going to go ahead and label that one. And we don't need to go up any further than that because our highest like y intercept is exactly at 75. So we'll just go up to there. To make graphing a little bit easier, I'm going to just do the same thing on the x-axis. Um, I'll just go up to 75 and do everything by 5. So this would be 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, 60, 65, 70, 75, and then I'll stop there. And you can always go back and like add extra shape marks if you need it for like labeling and stuff like that. Okay, so I'm going to focus on this one first, getting that graphed. So that y intercept is b it's 65 so i go to the y-axis which is the one that goes up or down and i put a point at 65 which is right here and then my slope m is negative one we usually think of slope as a fraction like rise over run 
So if it's not a fraction, if it's just like a regular number, you can put it over one. And if that's my like slope is rise over run, rise means how far am I going up or down? So negative one would be going down one. And then in the denominator run is how far left or right. So if it's a positive one, I'd be going right one. So um, I know that I scaled my x and y axis by fives. And sometimes we have to be careful about how we graph if we um, like scale them differently. But if they're both worth the same amount, like both sides are going up by fives, then I can kind of graph like I would normally would because they balance each other out. Like going, this is um, here. So if I go down one, right one, my next point would be right here. That's technically going down five, right five, but down five, right five simplifies to negative one. So it ends up being the same slope, even though the scaling is a little bit different than it normally would be. So down one, right one, and then I can go ahead and I can connect to those points because that's enough. I just need like two points for a straight line. If you want to add more points, you can. Um, you would just continue to, co continue to go down one, right one, and so on. Okay, so I'll connect those. Um, oops, got a little ahead of myself. Remember, before you go to connect them, you have to look at what type of inequality symbol you have, if it's strict or non-strict. Um, if basically, if it has the or equal to sign under it. So if it has the or equal to sign underneath it, it's a solid line. It is not dashed. So we're going to draw a solid line. I'm going to make this go straight through each corner as possible. That looks pretty good. And then I'm going to thicken it up a little bit. Okay. So, and then just remember now with inequalities, we just have to check a point to like decide which side of the line to shade. So, zero, zero is not on this point. It's right, or on this line, it's right there. So, I'm just going to check with zero, zero. Remember, we take a point, we put it in the inequality, and that's what helps us determine which direction to shade. So, I think I'm going to... Just kind of do that work up off to the side over here, just so it doesn't get too mixed in with the other stuff. So I take my inequality, which is y is greater than or equal to, y is greater than or equal to negative x plus 65. And then the point I want to check is 0, 0. So I'm going to take... Ah, sorry, that went crazy. I'm going to take my zero, zero. And I'm going to put zero in for x and then zero in for y. So that would become zero is greater than or equal to negative zero is just still zero plus 65. So then zero plus 65 is just 65. So this would simplify to 0 is greater than or equal to 65, which that is not true. So remember, if it's not true, you have to shade the side that is opposite of the point that you checked. So it wasn't true. It's no good. So that means that, you know, 0, 0 was on this side down here. I have to shade the opposite side of the line. So I would shade um, all up here. Okay, and then all the way down to the line as well. And then I'm gonna erase this, that shouldn't be there. And then now we're ready to move on to the next inequality. Okay, so now I know this is a long problem, I'm sorry. Um, now we're moving on to y is less than or equal to negative 5 fourths x plus 75. So b is 75, that's our y-intercept. I'm gonna start by putting a point at 75 on the y-axis. And then m is negative 5 fourths. So negative 5 fourths um, for slope means that I have to go down 5 for my rise and then right 4 for my run. And then same thing here because both like axes are labeled the same way, like both by 5s. 
we can just count the units and it works out okay. The only time that doesn't work is if they have a different scaling, like if one was five and one was 10 or one was five and one was two or something like that. So for my rise, I'm going down one, two, three, four, five, and then my run is four, one, two, three, four. So my next point would be right here. And then I'm just gonna go one more time to get a third point. So one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four. And that just really helps to like make sure your graph is as accurate as possible. I think I'm actually gonna do these in a different color, not green though, so it doesn't like, or it has a little bit better contrast. Okay, so points right here, right here, right here, and then I'm gonna go ahead and connect those. And then check the inequality symbol. This is uh, like less than or equal to. So since it's or equal to, I would do the line underneath it. And then I'm ready to go ahead and connect. And then I'm just going to thicken it up a bit. And then we can start deciding like which direction we need to shade. So same process here. We would pick a point that is not on the line. And then we would check it in the inequality. So I'm going to pick 0, 0 again. So if I take my inequality, so I take 0, 0. I take my inequality, which is this one. It's y is less than or equal to negative 5 fourths x plus 75. I put 0 in for y. That becomes 0 is less than or equal to. And then I'm going to put 0 in for x. It's less than or equal to negative 5 fourths times 0 plus 75. And then this whole thing is 0. Like any number times 0 is 0. And then if we add 0 to 75, that whole side simplifies to just 0. Um, if you're like, why are you doing that? <laughs> um, you have to go back and watch uh, lesson 14 again because that's where we kind of introduce it in the main time. So now we check to see if the inequality is true or not. Zero is, like, is less than or equal to 75. That is true. So since it's true, have to shade the side of the line that includes zero, zero. So this is the side that includes zero, zero. That's the side that I would shade. So, like, that lower left side. And then everywhere up to that line. Okay, so almost done. So now um, we're getting close. We just have to identify what the solution set is, which for inequalities, the solution set is like the shaded region. So for a system, it's gonna be where the shaded region overlaps. So I'm gonna zoom way in on that. Um, it's basically this little, and I didn't really like shade all the way down to the blue line here, fix that and then shade all the way up to the red line for this one but it's where the shading overlaps so it's kind of like this little triangle guy right here where the shading overlaps that's our solution set so those are all the possible combinations of like students that can go on the field trip and adults that can go on the field trip okay so that's it there's our solution set. We're going to move on to 15.2, which is basically taking the same problem and just like kind of interpreting it a little bit more. So 15.2 is taking the problem that we just pretty much worked on and just digging a little bit deeper, but we've already done all the work for it, which that's pretty nice. So starting up here, use the graph to determine the following. Anytown high school students requires five adults to go on the school trip. How many students can go? So in order to find that, like we have to look within the solution set, which that's the double shaded region. We have to find where within that solution set does five adults fall. So this graph is just a very, very zoomed in version of the graph that we just did and you know possibly prettier. But basically, this is just a section of the solution set. So it's a section of that like pink part that got highlighted over or like drawn over our original graph. So just super zoomed in, focused on like what the question is actually asking, but just know that they're the same graph. Okay, so um, one thing I want you to keep in mind is because the same graph, the x and y axis are labeled the same way, meaning the x axis, the one that goes side to side is the adult tickets. 
and then the student one, the y-axis, or the y-axis, the one that goes up and down, should be student tickets. Okay, so it asked, um, or it says that it requires five, ad five adults, excuse me, to go on the school trip. So if we go on the x-axis, because that's adults, and find five, that's right here. So we want to find where that is like within our solution set. And we want to like kind of maximize the amount of students that are going. So how it says like how many students can go on the trip, you would assume that that means like at most, like how many students can go, not just like, oh, well, one can go or something like that. Um, not one, but it's not an exact answer. But what I'm trying to get at is, you know, if we're trying to maximize, we want to go to as high as we can get on the students. So as high up in the solution sets we can get because the higher we go, the more students are going to end up going and we want to maximize how many students we want on the trip. So you'll see like if I zoom in even further, um, then like adults being five, that point is right there. Like I just kind of put it within that circle and that point is very, very, very outside of the solution set and unfortunately like this is the point 569 and because we're like technically right here like that's the highest point that's like i don't know 68 point something something maybe 68.8 or something we can't round up though because it's people um we can't like round up to be able to include a, an extra person if we can't really afford to bring that extra person so even though it's really close to 69 and we would normally like round up we have to round down in this case we have to take like the next closest point which for five adults would be down here at 568 Okay, so we have to round down. Um, if five adults are required to go on the trip, then 68 students can go on, our, on the trip. That's our answer. Okay, moving down to 15.3. So 15.3 is about linear programming. Um, I will kind of warn you, this is going to be a fairly long problem. It is going to kind of stretch your mind a bit. So if you need to take like a little break before playing this last problem, it wouldn't be a bad idea. Just make sure you come back to it. So 15.3, Alberto earns money by washing cars and mowing lawns around the neighborhood. It takes him 30 minutes to mow a lawn and an hour to wash a car. He only has 10 hours available each week to dedicate to working. I'm going to go ahead and highlight important piece of information from that first section before we move on. So it takes him 30 minutes to mow a lawn and one hour to wash a car. He only has 10 hours available each week. And then in the second paragraph, he buys supplies for performing these tasks, such as gas for the lawnmower, soap, sponges, and wax for the cars. It costs him $1.25 to mow the lawn, $1.75 in total to wash a car. He doesn't want to spend more than $20 per week on supplies. So important piece of information, it costs him $1.25 to mow a lawn, $1.75 to wash a car. He doesn't want to spend more than $20 per week. Okay, third paragraph, for every lawn he mows, he earns $5. For every car he washes, he earns $8. Alberto wants to know how many lawns he should mow and how many cars he should watch per week in order to maximize his profit. So he earns $5 for every lawn he mows and $8 for every car he washes. So he wants to figure out, like, how can he maximize? That's a totally fair question, just a little bit more involved than you may initially think. Okay, so this last part is just the instructions on what we're doing. Write and graph a system of inequalities to represent the situation. Um, we're not going to graph it. We're just going to use this. I should have cut that graph part out. We're just going to write a system of inequalities. So first thing we're going to do is we're just going to write the two. Um, we can see what our variables are going to be just based on how the graph is labeled. The x is going to be the number of lawns mowed. Y is going to be the number of cars washed. So going back to like the very, very first paragraph, 
we can write an inequality that represents how much time he can take. So it says it takes him 30 minutes to mow a lawn and one hour to wash a car. He only has 10 hours each week, so he can spend up to 10 hours or anything less than 10 hours, but nothing more. So um, you'll notice that, you know, it's one hour to wash a car. He has 10 hours each week. So everything's in relation to hours. So the fact that it takes him 30 minutes to mow a lawn, we can't really think of it as minutes. We have to think of 30 minutes as a half hour. So like one half hour or like one half times X. So for the first inequality that we write, we want to total his time. So if 30 minutes is a half hour, it takes him 30 minutes or a half hour per lawn. So we would do 0.5 or half, doesn't matter times x, which was the number of lawns mowed, and then plus one hour times y, which was the number of cars washed, and that has to be up to, you can only spend 10 hours each week, so it's not going to be equal to 10, it could be less than or equal to 10. So you can't spend any more than 10 hours, so this is how much time he's going to spend total and it's less than or equal to 10. It could be anything less than or exactly 10. Okay, so for the next one, we're going to incorporate like how much it costs him and like his total that he wants to spend or what he wants to stay under. So it costs him $1.25 to mow a lawn. It costs him $1.75 to wash a car. So $1.25, oops, sorry, $1.25 times the amount of lawns that he mows, which that's X. And then plus 175 times the amount of cars that he washes, which is Y. And he doesn't want to spend more than $20. So anything less than $20 is okay. Exactly $20 is okay. So as an inequality, that would be less than or equal to 20. So this side is how much he's going to spend. That needs to be less than or equal to 20. Okay, so we have our inequalities. These are the inequalities that are graphed. So I just wanted to save, like, cut us a little bit of slack and not have to graph them again because we just spent so much time graphing it with the first problem. So these are inequalities. This, this is the system that matches this scenario. This is the graph for that system on the right. So now if we want to, well, first we'll look at the solution set. It's where the double shaded region is where you can see, like, kind of the diagonal lines. This whole section is the solution set. And then now if we want to figure out, okay, how do we like maximize his profit? We have to look at what's called the extreme points. So the extreme points are like where the lines intersect and they're always within the solution set. So like some extreme points would be like exactly where they intersect right here. And then also the um, like the highest points within the solution set on each axis. So like right here, it would not be right here though because that's not in the double shaded region. And then also right here, again, not right here because it's not within the solution set. It's not within the double shaded region. Those points represent like what could potentially be his max profit. Um, technically also zero, zero is an extreme point, but he's not going to maximize his profit by mowing zero lawns and washing zero cars. So we don't really have to worry about that one in this case. Okay, and then in order to figure out how much he's making during each of those three scenarios, like this is one, two, three, we have to figure out an equation that like actually represents how much profit he's earning. We don't have an equation for that yet. We have the first or inequality. The first inequality that we created was about the time. The second inequality that we created was about like how much he wanted to spend. So now we can go ahead and we can create just an actual equation to help us find the profit. And that comes from this third paragraph. So for profit, We'll write our equation, we'll use P for profit. And then it says for every lawn he mows, he earns $5. Lawns were X. So if he makes $5 per lawn, that would be five times X. And then for every car he washes, he earns $8. So cars were Y. So $8 per car would be 8Y. 
So now we can take this new equation. This represents his total profit, and we check the different points, the different extreme points from the graph. So we can check this point right here is 0, 10, because we don't go left or right at all. We just go up 10. So I'm going to check that one first, 0, 10. That would mean that x would be 0 and 10 would go in for y because remember it's like x first then y second so the profit would be 5 times 0 plus 8 times 10 profit is equal to 5 times 0 is 0 8 times 10 is 80 and then 80 plus 0 is 80 dollars so if he washes 10 cars he makes $80. Okay, and then now we'll check this point down here. This is 16, 0. So 16 lawns and 0 cars. So 0 is, or sorry, 16 is going to go in for x, and then 0 is going to go in for y into the same equation right here. We're just going to keep working with that equation. So it would be profit is equal to 5 times 16 and then plus 8 times 0. So profit is equal to um, 5 times 16, I think is 80. Yep, 5 times 16 is 80 plus 8 times 0 is 0. So 80 plus 0 is 80. So that profit would also be $80. So, so far he makes the same. If he like only mows lawns or if he only washes cars, he would just have to wash fewer cars than mow lawns. And then now we have to worry about this kind of like middle point here as well. So if this, sorry, I zoomed in a little bit far. If this point was like an exact point, we would only have to check that exact point, but it's like kind of in the middle. Um, we can't really do like decimals. Like let's say this would be like, I don't know, six point seven or something you can't wash or you can't mow like 0.7 of a lawn so we can only deal with like exact points so we have to worry about all the points that are around that so picture like a box that goes around that that connects to all the points exactly around it um this would be seven seven and then this point is seven six this point is 6, 6, and then this point is 6, 7. Okay, so we have to check some of them. We don't need to check 7, 7 because it's not within the solution set. Like this point right here is not in the double shaded region. The rest of them are. Um, like within the double shaded regions so they're within the solution set but like for six six for this point that's not going to be my max profit because with this one i like mow one more lawn and then with this point i wash one more car so my max profit is going to if it's higher than the first two we found it's going to come from either six seven or seven six i do have to check both of those to see though so we'll do say six seven first. And then I swear we are almost done with these. Okay, so six seven zero is or sorry, not zero. Um six is gonna go in for x and then seven is gonna go in for y. And then like I said, it's still the same profit equation. We're using that every single time now. So profit is equal to 5 times 6 for x, and then plus 8 times 7 for y. So 5 times 6 is 30, plus 8 times 7 is 56. So our profit is equal to 30 plus 56, which is 86. So oh, it's higher than our like previous one, which was 80. So we're getting somewhere. And then we just have to check the last one just to see if it's higher or not, just so we find like the true max profit. 
Okay, so we just checked uh, six, seven. We need to check seven, six now. That'll be our last one. So seven, six. So seven is going in for x, six is going in for y. Again, same equation right here. So p profit is equal to five x. It'll be five times seven plus eight y. It'll be eight times six. 5 times 7 is 35, 8 times 6 is 48, so if we add 35 plus 48, it's 83. So we get profit equals $83. Okay, so we found all of our different like possibilities for the maxes. This one was the highest one at $86. That was six lawns because remember x's was lawns and then seven cars because y was cars so we can just write that final answer as a sentence and then we will be good so i forgot the end in lawns sorry um okay so we say his profit or he can max maximize his profit by mowing six lawns and washing seven cars. And done.